Hi, my name is Ann Battle, and I'm head of benchmark reform at ISSA. And I'm joined today by Deepak Fitlani from Linklaters and Lansing Cottrell and Sherry Criscanal from IHS Market. On this webinar, we're going to cover the bilateral templates that ISDA has published for counterparties to use in implementing the IBOR fallback. This webinar will also cover how to negotiate and agree to those templates on ISDA Create, as well as the Outreach 360 service provided by IHS Market for firms to engage with their counterparties on implementation of the new fallback. So this is the third in a series of three webinars published in connection with the launch of the ISDA IBOR fallback documentation. We encourage you to go back and listen to the first two webinars if you haven't done so already. As mentioned, this webinar is intended to assist market participants in understanding the bilateral forms of amendment and template language that ISDA has produced for counterparties who either adhere to the ISDA IBOR fallback protocol but want to supplement it with additional agreements or who choose to agree to incorporate the new IBOR fallback in their legacy documents bilaterally as opposed to via the protocol. Um, in particular, we'll give an explanation of each of the form of amendment agreements as well as the template wording and how that template wording can be used within the amendment agreements or otherwise. And we'll go through a few examples of how and why counterparties might want to use these templates. Then we'll talk about using them on ISDA Create, as I mentioned, um, and Sherry and Lansing will go through the IHS Market Outreach 360 service. I'm gonna start by talking about the forms of amendment agreement that we've published. Um, and then turn it over to Deepak to talk about some of the template language that could be used within these forms of an amendment agreement. So this slide covers um, the amendment agreements that counterparties could use to bilaterally adopt the protocol. And as we've covered in a separate um, a separate webinar, the protocol is really no different than a standard amendment, except it allows for agreement to the amendment multilaterally, that is with all counterparties who also adhere to the protocol, as opposed to bilaterally. So these templates are meant for counterparties if one or both of the counterparties, for whatever reason, does not adhere to the protocol, but those counterparties still have legacy IBOR transactions for which they need the new fallback. We've published a short form and a long form of this amendment agreement. And for each of the short form and the long form, we've published a version that could be used if one of the counterparties is an agent that is agreeing to the amendments on behalf of underlying clients, and a form that could be used if both parties are entering into the agreement as principals. The short form enables counterparties to incorporate by reference the amendments made by the protocol in exactly their same, their same form. So if counterparties use the short form and don't add any different modifications or supplemental language, then they will have effectuated exactly the same thing as they would have effectuated if both of them adhere to the protocol, but they're able to do so bilaterally if one of them chooses not, or both one or both of them chooses not to adhere to the protocol. It's also possible, using the short form of the amendment agreement, to agree to supplemental terms that we'll come on to in a few minutes. The long form actually contains the entire text of the amendment provisions, which are in the attachment to the protocol. Um, so in this long form of the amendment agreement, counterparties could, if they chose to, modify the terms of those amendments um, as they agree to them bilaterally. They could also add additional supplemental terms based on the template language that we're going to talk about or other um, you know, supplemental provisions that they want to add to this bilateral agreement. 
So the long form is much longer, and in some cases will include provisions that are not applicable, um, but it does allow for more flexibility. Another thing that counterparties could do with the long form would be to remove some of the non-applicable provisions if that is um, you know, more desirable or easier to negotiate um, with, a, with a counterparty um, that only needs these amendments for a narrow scope of transaction. So the final form of amendment agreement that we've published is actually for two counterparties who have both adhered to the protocol. So they've agreed to the protocol, they've agreed to all of the terms in the attachment to the protocol. So their legacy contracts with each other have the fallbacks, but they might want to use some of the supplemental language that DPAC is going to cover. And to do so, they need to agree to that language bilaterally. They could do so in a form of side letter that they produce and are comfortable with themselves. But in order to facilitate those supplemental agreements, We've published this form of amendment agreement that basically contains um, the wrapper language you'd typically see in a bilateral amendment agreement and some boilerplate. This form of amendment agreement is also set up um, to make it easy for counterparties to agree to some of the supplemental terms um, in the template language that we're going to talk about. And um, like everything we're covering today, this will be available on ISDA Create. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Deepak to talk about um, the template language. Great. Thanks, Anne. So I'm going to kick off with uh, probably the most complicated uh, form of template language. And so this is language that is there to exclude agreements or transactions from the scope of the amendments made uh, by the protocol and and so so effectively removing documents from scope and and for those documents that are removed from scope um, agreeing to to bespoke fallbacks um, so 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 this this uh, set of template provisions as I say is the most complicated and the reason for that is, there are various options within, within the, the template. And this was because um, we felt that there might well be different ways in which people may want to exclude documents from scope. And as we go through, you'll see that they're all variations on a theme, but what we wanted to do was to try and do as much of the, the work for users of the template provisions uh, so that we could make their lives a little bit, a little bit easier. Um, and it may well be that actually the majority of users just use the most simple option. But let me let me run you through those um, so that you can uh, get a feel for what they do. So the first option um, is the most simple, and what it does is it allows parties to exclude um, from the scope of the protocol a set of identified documents, um, and uh, and then in their place they can apply alternative triggers or, or fallbacks for, for those documents. Now, if they do that, it's for the parties to, to decide what, um, what those alternative triggers and fallbacks are. Um, one, one thing I would say is, is that this template, as with the others, can be used with either of the amendment agreements that Anne mentioned. And so to the extent that it's being used with um, with an amendment agreement which contemplates the parties having already adhered to the protocol, then the effect of, of, of um, removing documents from the scope is effectively reversing the change made pursuant to the protocol. So it doesn't mean that the change wasn't made by the protocol. It just means that having made the change pursuant to the protocol, the parties are now, are now reversing that. So the second option within this template uh, allows parties to, again, exclude the protocol from applying to an identified set of documents. Um, and then it allows parties to contemplate that the floating rate option uh, within those identified documents will instead track the approach taken to 
uh, the benchmark in an underlying cash instrument. So this is really for people who want their uh, derivative contract to follow the the cash instrument that that, that derivative contract is is likely to be to be hedging. Um, and so so you have the ability within this option to nominate multiple uh, documents that are taken out of scope from the protocol. And then for each one of those documents, you can identify what's known as a reference contract, which is ultimately the, the cash instrument that that um, derivative is looking to, to hedge. You have uh, a, the third option within this template, which allows parties, again, to exclude the, scope, uh, the protocol applying to a range of documents. But this range of documents are those that contain what are known as negotiated fallbacks. So the definition of negotiated fallbacks is, is for the parties to, um, to populate. So, so it could be that they describe what they consider to be negotiated fallbacks uh, in, in whatever way they see fit. There is also optional language within this template to, um, to contemplate uh, uh, negotiated fallbacks being uh, a, a provision that already contemplates what should happen upon the occurrence of a permanent cessation or um, or a LIBOR rate not being representative. Um, option four effectively combines option one and three. So this allows you to exclude documents from, from scope as well as exclude uh, documents that have negotiated fallbacks and in their place um, you can contemplate alternative triggers and fallbacks. And option five essentially combines options one, two, and three. So you can exclude the protocol from applying to identified documents, as well as documents which contain negotiated fallbacks, and also then contemplate alternative triggers and fallbacks, as well as contemplating that a, a floating rate option will track the approach taken in a cash instrument that that, that is being hedged. So you'll see as I mentioned, it's just variations on a theme in terms of how you can combine the different options together, depending on how you want to use the, the template. Um, so that's all I had on that template. So if we move forward to the next um, set of template provisions, the first one uh, on the slide is one that allows parties to include additional documents within the scope of the protocol. And, and so this is a relatively simple uh, piece of language that allows parties to identify uh, additional documents, as I say, that they want to, to have within scope. The next template uh, set of provisions allows parties to disapply the pre-cessation trigger. So as was covered in a, an earlier webinar, the pre-cessation trigger is hardwired into the protocol for LIBOR rate options. And it applies when the FCA, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority, announces that LIBOR is not representative and that the representativeness will not be restored. And so if you do not want that trigger to apply, i.e. if you only want within your, your contract a, a permanent cessation trigger to apply, then you can use this template to remove um, that, that trigger. The last protocol, uh, sorry, the last template on this slide um, contemplates uh, being used with new documents. Um, and so this is, for example, where you have uh, a new document that does not include or incorporate the 2006 definitions or otherwise contemplate a rate option as defined in the 2006 definitions. And so here, effectively, what you can do is apply the terms of paragraph five or six of the attachment to the protocol um, so that you can import the, um, the, the fallbacks. But equally, if you want to disapply the pre-cessation trigger, then that is also a, a, an option within this set of, um, set of provisions. So, so then the final um, template just set of provisions to talk about is, is a set of provisions that can be used for new confirmations. And so by new confirmations, I mean confirmations that incorporate the 2006 definitions once the supplement, the fallback supplement has, has been published. Because when the supplement um, is published, 
then the new trades will effectively incorporate the uh, the pre-cessation trigger as well as the permanent cessation trigger. And so if parties at confirmation level want to disapply that pre-cessation trigger, then they can do so um, using this template language. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Anne just to run through uh, or start running us through some examples as to how these templates can be used. Thanks, Deepak. I know that was a lot of information with a lot of different options. So we thought we would go through on the next few slides a few examples of, as I mentioned at the beginning, how and why counterparties might want to um, use these templates. So I'm going to start with a few examples of how counterparties who have not adhered to the protocol could use these templates. And these examples would um, apply equally if only one of the parties had adhered to the protocol because as covered on a separate webinar, the amendments made by the protocol only apply if both of the counterparties adhere to the protocol. So the first example A on this slide is very straightforward. Party A and Party B have not adhered to the protocol, but they want to bilaterally adopt it. Um, and both of them are principals. They're not, um, they haven't entered into the ISDA master agreement as principals. Um, and you know, this might be the case because in this example, they have one is the master agreement that would be a protocol covered document. And so maybe they don't want to use the protocol because they're only amending one document as opposed to some, um, some market participants who have um, hundreds or thousands of protocol covered documents. So in this case, the counterparties could effectuate exactly what they want to do by using the, temp the short form template form of agreement um, and the principal version of that. So by agreeing to that template and its, um, and its published form, they would apply the new fallbacks to the transactions entered into under their ISDA master agreement. Um, so in example B on this slide, we also have party A and party B who have not adhered to the protocol. But in this case, they have a credit support annex for variation margin, um, which doesn't incorporate a relevant is the definitional booklet, but does reference US dollar LIBOR. So as mentioned on a prior, uh, prior webinar, um, this reference to US dollar LIBOR would be amended by the protocol to include the new fallbacks because the CSA is a protocol covered document. And they want to agree to the fallbacks for that reference to US dollar LIBOR, but they don't want paragraphs one through five of the attachment to the protocol because none of the terms of those paragraphs are applicable to this agreement and they'd rather just not have um, so many non-applicable terms in their bilateral amendment. So as mentioned earlier, if counterparties use the long form of the amendment agreement, then they can remove non-applicable provisions. So in this case, counterparties could um, implement the fallbacks in their legacy CSA by using the long form template form of agreement um, and removing paragraphs one through five. And in this example, um, party A is an agent that has entered into the CSA on behalf of underlying clients. So they would use the agency version of the long form amendment. So on this slide in example C, we're going to move on to something slightly more complicated, but we're also in a scenario where party A and party B have not adhered to the protocol. They want to adopt the terms of the protocol, so they want to implement the new fallbacks in their legacy transactions. Um, but they want to do so with a few modifications. And specifically, as mentioned in Romanet 1 and Romanet 2, they want to exclude um, one particular swap confirmation that was entered into to hedge a loan. And in this case, that loan has its own fallbacks that they want to match. They also, when applying um, the new fallbacks to their legacy transactions, want to disapply the pre-cessation trigger. 
And as we've mentioned on a prior webinar and as Deepak just covered, the pre-cessation trigger is for LIBOR rate options, so references to LIBOR in documentation, and it provides for a move to the fallback rate if the UK FCA determines that LIBOR is non-representative, even if LIBOR does not cease at that time. So in this case, Party A and Party B do not want to move to fallbacks at that time. They instead want to move to fallbacks only if a permanent cessation of LIBOR occurs. So in this case, because the counterparties are supplementing um, the amendments made by the protocol as opposed to modifying or removing any of them, they could use the short form template form of amendments. Um, but in doing so, um, to accomplish the two other objectives that they had, they would include the template wording to exclude the confirmation they have for the loan or the confirmation for the swap that hedges the loan. And in doing so, they would use option two that Deepak talked about, which provides that for that particular swap, instead of including the new fallbacks that are being implemented, via the IBOR fallback supplement and IBOR fallback protocol, the fallbacks that apply to that particular swap will be the fallbacks that apply um, to the loan in the, in the documentation for the hedged loan. And then they would also add to that short form of amendments the template language for disapplying the pre-cessation triggers and fallbacks for LIBOR. So I'm now going to um, turn it back to Deepak to go through a few more examples. Great. Thanks, Anne. So, so the next example is one where the parties have already adhered to the protocol uh, and they have an existing master agreement. So not a, an ISDA master agreement, but, but some other form of master agreement that is not within the scope of the protocol. So you may well remember that um, the protocol covers a number of non-ISDA master agreements and credit support documents, but it just so happens in this case that the two parties are parties to a, a master agreement that is not within scope of those, those additional master agreements either. And, and what they want to do is extend the application of the protocol to cover that, um, that master agreement. So the way in which they can do that is, is to use the template wording that I touched on earlier, which allows parties to include additional existing documents uh, to, to the scope of the application of, of the protocol. And they can do that in whatever form they want, but if they choose to, they can uh, use the template form of uh, language um, that 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 is that has has published. Um, so the next example is uh, where Party A and Party B are about to enter into a new master agreement. Uh, that master agreement won't incorporate the 2006 definitions, but they nevertheless want to be sure that the terms of the protocol will will apply. So that if there are transactions entered into under that master agreement, then the permanent cessation fallbacks will apply, but they're not keen on the pre-cessation provisions that uh, otherwise apply to uh, LIBOR rate options. So, so in that example, what the parties can do is they can um, take the template provisions that uh, allow parties to apply the terms of the protocol to new agreements that don't incorporate the 2006 definitions. And also within that language, they can uh, make the election to disapply uh, the pre-cessation trigger. So, so here, given that they are entering into a new, new agreement, they may well just look to drop those template provisions into the new agreement itself. The next example is where you have two parties who are entering into a new interest rate swap. So in this example that references Swiss franc LIBOR, um, and they are going to incorporate the 2006 definitions, but what they want to do is disapply the pre-cessation provision. So, so remember that this is in a scenario where the ISDA IBOR fallback supplement has been published 
And so automatically, by virtue of incorporating the 2006 definitions uh, in relation to a LIBOR rate option, both the permanent cessation and the pre-cessation uh, provisions would apply. So if they, if they want to disapply the pre-cessation aspect of, of that, then they can use the template wording uh, for use with confirmations that incorporate the 2006 definitions and effectively just drop that into the, the new confirmation that they are entering into. Um, so I'll, I'll finish off the examples um, with one more complicated example where parties are trying to do a variety of things in one go. So, so here the example is where party A and party B have already adhered to the protocol and they have um, uh, some master agreements that are protocol covered master agreements and they have uh, some existing master agreements that are not protocol covered documents um, and, and, and they are both acting as principles. So, so now what they want to do is exclude one of their protocol covered master agreements from the scope of the protocol. They want to bring into play two, um, two other master agreements that are not currently within the scope of the protocol. And for four of the protocol covered master agreements that they, they have, they want to disapply the pre-cessation provisions in the protocol. So they want to do a number of things. And so, so the way in which they can do that is firstly, because we're in a situation where the parties have already adhered to the protocol, they can use the template form of amendment uh, that, that is relevant where parties have adhered to the protocol and want to uh, update in relation to existing agreements. And then they can drop in various uh, template provisions. So the first one being to exclude documents from scope and then identify the protocol covered master agreement that they want to exclude. They can then uh, drop in the template provision that allows for the scope of the protocol to be extended to cover additional documents. So in relation to the two master agreements that would not otherwise be protocol covered documents. And then finally, they can include the template wording to disapply the pre-cessation trigger uh, for those four protocol covered documents or protocol covered master agreements where they want those provisions to be to be disapplied. So, so I think with that, we will finish up with the um, examples. And I'm conscious that, that what we've done is deliberately to try and come up with a number of permutations just so that you can get a feel for how the template amendment agreements as well as the template language can be used in conjunction. So that's very much a, a mix and match type type approach. Um, and so, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is 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 to create. And so, so we're very mindful that uh, whilst whilst protocol adherence is is definitely uh, the easy way to um, uh, apply the new fallbacks, that that for various reasons it may well be that parties would like to um, to 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 make bilateral arrangements, and hence the publication of of, of those bilateral documents we've just been talking about. But equally, we're mindful that there are a number of parties out there who have um, agreements in place. So, so is to create allows for a relatively smooth process in order to uh, to get those bilateral agreements in in place. So, so at a very high level, um, is to create uh, was first launched in 2019, uh, and it was focused on the regulatory initial margin documents. Um, but recently, uh, ISDA announced that the breadth or the scope of documents that would be covered by uh, ISDA Create would, would be broadening. And, and for our purposes, what's relevant is that they would be capturing the interest rate reform documents that um, ISDA has published and, and may well continue to publish. So, so there are four key elements to, to the platform. So the first one is the platform allows you to generate documents. So you can do that by creating templates and in a very easy way, and I'll come on to show you in a minute um, how that, what that looks like. You can basically produce documents in, in a very quick and easy way. Once you produce documents, you can negotiate them online. And so that allows parties to exchange comments uh, between, each, between each other 
and to the extent necessarily necessary black line changes that are that are that are required. And once you get to a position that uh, the document is agreed, then then you can um, you can have that document signed. And so within the platform, you have uh, an approvals process because it may well be that um, negotiators need to seek specific approval from from other colleagues. And so that can be built into the platform. And once you've done that, you can then have a full audit trail of both comments as well as approvals um, for, for any particular negotiation. And then finally, and for me, this has always been a really important piece of the platform, you can capture the data that comes out of it. So, so this allows you to generate reports uh, that relate to all of the data that is within the agreement, including all of the approvals process. Um, and you've got a 100% accurate set of data that you can then use to operationalize uh, downstream. So I'll just show you very quickly um, some of the other slides uh, on how how the platform works. So, so this is the dashboard, which is basically the hub for users of the platform, and it gives you a bird's eye view of all negotiations. And it basically gives you uh, a high level of management information as to who's doing what, what's the status of particular negotiations. So for example, how much is in my court versus how much is in my counterparty's court. And it's an interactive uh, dashboard, so you can drill down by clicking on any of the analytics features and you just get more detail. And equally, if you want to, you can export all of the data into an Excel file. So then if we move to the next slide, you can see this is a screenshot of the uh, automation and negotiation piece. So, so the first time uh, you, you go through a document, you can then effectively save it as a preset or as a template, if you like. And then you can use it for for a, a number of, of negotiations. And if need be, you can produce documents and send them out in bulk, uh, as, as may well be relevant for for um, for rate reform. So so what this shows you is is a split screen format. So for those of you who are very familiar with working with with documents, you'll see that on on the right hand side. But you interact with the elections on the left hand side, and as soon as you click. So, for example, if you click that the uh, repeating representations are applicable, then as soon as you do that, the document will update in 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 real time on the right hand side. Um, and the status bar at the top uh, shows you how close to uh, agreement you are. So, so here you have a negotiation where 38 percent of the elections um, have been um, agreed. And so obviously there's a little bit of a way to go before that document is, is finalized. So if we move to the next slide, you'll see another example of an election. Um, and, and I guess just to, just to flag that one thing that you can do is if, for example, this election is, is, um, is not agreed, for example, you can go and get approvals to, um, to, to, to get the relevant permission to, to agree to, to this election. Um, if we move to the next slide, I touched on data earlier. Um, so, so for me, uh, if you if you document this uh, um, contracts using this platform, then effectively all of the data is caught at the time of creating the contract, and so all of the data is also captured in a very structured way. So you can basically take every single election. Um, and analyze, for example, how many uh, contracting counterparties have uh, made that particular election uh, as well. So this happens automatically. Uh, so it's it's uh, immediate and there is no risk of um, incorrect data transposition, which is which is obviously the risk that people run nowadays, where after an agreement is executed, someone then has to um, Put the data into into their system. So so here and a number of users have already plugged into APIs that can leverage um, the the data from here and downstream it into uh, into other systems. 
Um, so, so I guess just finally to finish that if you do need any more information on, on is to create then on, um, on this next slide, we have the contact information um, if you do need any more data. So that's is to create at is .org or is to create at nakoda.ai. Um, so Anne, I'll, I'll stop there if that's okay. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, um, and as a reminder, all of the bilateral templates are available for negotiation on um, is to create, and you'll be able to add the template language we talked to to the, the forms of agreement, which will hopefully um, make any negotiations a little bit more seamless than they would have been via paper. Um, so for the last part of this webinar, I'm going to turn it over to Lansing and Sherry from IHS Market to talk about um, their Outreach 360 services. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so this is Lansing Cottrell. Hello, everyone. Um, I am here with uh, my colleague, Sherry Kurasinkel. As part of the launch of the ISDA IBOR fallback protocol, we're happy to help with this uh, webinar on options firms have to facilitate their counterparties adhering to the protocol. As many of you know, for the past eight years, IHS Market and ISDA have been in a partnership known as ISDA Amend, whose stated goal is to streamline the implementation of protocols across the industry after a counterparty decides to adhere. ISDA Amend does this by automating the dissemination of counterparty-specific attestations, elections, carve-outs, et cetera, as they relate to relevant protocols. Now today, we will be talking about an additional service known as Outreach 360. This also helps streamline the implementation of protocols across the industry, but by engaging a counterparty before, as opposed to after, adhering to the protocol. Outreach 360 does this by providing the counterparty with educational content, guidelines, and contractual impact assessments to highlight to the counterparty the benefits of protocol adherence. And yet the end goal of Outreach 360 and is to amend is the same maximize the number of counterparties adhering to the protocol and provide granular details on which clients will adhere, which ones will not, and why. To illustrate this point, we thought we would compare some of the more widely adopted protocols over time. This slide shows the number of adhering counterparties to the Dodd-Frank protocols and the U.S. Stay protocol. We wanted to highlight the U.S. Stay protocol because it was the first protocol where a large group of banks utilized our Outreach 360 tool to encourage their counterparties to adhere. The graph here shows on the left how Dodd-Frank 1 and 2 quickly increased to around 12,000 adhering counterparties in the first 18 months before the growth in adherence started leveling off somewhat. But after eight years, the total number of adherents for Dodd-Frank 1 and 2 stood at close to 25,000 counterparties. By contrast, the U.S. Stay Protocol, um, we contracted with eight banks to use our Outreach 360 tool in a coordinated outreach campaign. As you can see in the graph on the right, the resulting uptake was dramatic. It took only 18 months for the U.S. Stay Protocol to clock 25,000 adhering counterparties. Now, obviously, there are many factors behind the successful adoption of the U.S. Stay, but we believe that one of the key factors was the coordinated communication by our staff using Outreach 360 to contact over 50% of all adhering counterparties on behalf of eight banks. So what is Outreach 360? Outreach 360 is an agnostic client communication tool that sits within our counterparty manager ecosystem, just like ISDA Amend does. For Ivor Transition, it is currently being used by broker dealers to manage the client communication campaigns regarding their respective IBOR transition plans, both in the OTC derivatives market per the ISDA protocol, as well as other client verticals like loans and fixed income that are impacted by the transition. This is possible because Outreach 360 is a versatile platform. It can support one-way communication, such as education material on links to the protocol, or even a link encouraging firms to use ISDA Create on a bilateral basis. Questionnaires can be sent out to collect necessary operational and regulatory data, confirmation or attestation from the counterparty on their status or intention can be collected, and even the distribution of amendments to bilateral loans that counterparties can then redline and sign electronically on this platform. In terms of track record, Outreach 360 has been in use for over three years now across a wide array of regulatory use cases from SFTR and MIFID II to the U.S. state protocols previously mentioned. 
It has been used by 19 global and regional banks across APAC, EMEA, and North America. And we are excited to bring this experience and track record to assist our clients in making the ISDA IBOR protocol a smashing success. And with that, I will hand over to my colleague, Sherry Kurasinkel, to describe and show the nuts and bolts of how Outreach 360 will operate with the upcoming protocol. Thank you, Lansing. In addition to what uh, Lansing mentioned around the capabilities of Outreach 360, uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit about where uh, the technology and the service can come together to provide uh, an outcome-focused solution for the broker community. In general, it starts with working on population analysis and cleaning that entity reference data to ensure that the, the entity population and the contact population are married together for a clean outreach. Uh, then it includes reaching out to the client with notification, engagements, educational material, letting them know what is happening with the IBAR protocol and how they can conduct the next steps either with the ISDA protocol or any bilateral outreach. Um, IHS markets, uh, managed services monitors that adherence and looks at the bank's demand list against the protocol adherence and marries those two together. And where clients have not adhered to the protocol and haven't provided any feedback, the system will continue to chase at a defined frequency to ensure that there's consistent outreach and consistent client touch points. Where a client provides feedback saying that they would like to have um, a, a different approach, whether a bilateral template, uh, Outreach 360 can direct them to have to ISDA create for those bilateral templates or send them separate non-standard bilateral documents for uh, uh, redlining and negotiation. And finally, all of this information, all of this data, all of this reporting can be piped through back to the bank uh, through Excel reports and an API. Here you're seeing the landing page of the Outreach 360 dashboard for the broker. Uh, the whole concept of Outreach 360 was around auditability and mass reporting when you're sending out thousands to tens of thousands of emails to multiple counterparties. Of the many features, one of the things that's key in this item is our email management functionality. So we start with our email templates. And our email templates are full, there's a full HTML builder on the platform that allows you to customize your email to have exactly the look and feel per your individual bank's brand guidelines. Within the email, you can see an HTML builder on the left and a text builder on the right. And within the email, we allow the ability to add dynamic tags to the email. And the dynamic tags can reference individual counterparty entity reference data which will populate onto the email dynamically to give you a more customized email approach. This functionality is easily adjustable by any user of the platform. Once we've created an email template, we can go into a, a campaign. And in this example of a campaign, I'll just walk you through what an outreach campaign generally looks like. To start with, uh, there are these seven chevrons, and the chevrons really guide you through what a set of process looks like between general campaign details, the entity selection, so you can select for that outreach campaign as you're reaching out to people for the ISDA protocol, you can select all of your counterparty entities that are relevant as part of this outreach. You can tag the outreach to specific users, so you know which users, which counterparties are going to get that outreach. From a content selection perspective, you can send out uh, educational documentation such as PDFs to your counterparty to let them know the impact of the IBOR protocol, or you can send them links it directly into ISDA's website, and we'll show that in a second. And finally, you get to add that email, that customized email to this campaign, which goes out and you can review and submit it. Now, one of the cool features about Outreach 360, when we think about mass outreach, is that control function. We want to make sure that what you're sending out is what is expected uh, from an outreach perspective. And so we have this email management functionality that allows you to export everything in Excel and make sure that the receivers that you are expecting are exactly the receivers that should be getting this communication. You can also preview the mail in an HTML format to see what is actually going out. And when you're comfortable with that particular outreach, 
you can send that email to, uh, to the receivers. The whole point of Outreach 60 is to do a lot of that heavy uplift that you normally would have to do manually with teams of outreach personnel. This is organizing the data for you and managing a lot of the manual outreaches and, and tracking. One final thing I'd like to show, uh, here is an example of an email it, it, that would have gone out uh, for the US state protocol. And we can apply this kind of idea to uh, the IVOR protocol. Within the wording, as you can see, the name of the institution has been dynamically generated into the email. And in addition to that, we are linking the ISDA protocol onto this email. So in this case, it's the USD protocol. If I click on it, it will take the user directly to the protocol and they can go ahead and adhere. For those links, we can include click tracking. So you can tell how your users are engaging with those emails to see if you do have the right contacts. And we find that through the metrics that we can generate for you on Outreach 60, if you find that certain users are non-responsive, it gives you exactly the right data you need to adjust course. Thanks, Jerry, and thanks to all of our speakers today. Uh, I wanted to conclude this by letting everyone know where they can find additional information about the ISDA IBOR fallback uh, documentation. Um, the links on this website will give you um, information about background documents that ISDA has published for educational purposes, as well as um, links to the actual ISDA IBOR fallback supplement protocol and the bilateral templates that you've gone through that we've gone through today. If you have questions, please email benchmarkreform at isda.org or any of the other email addresses for specific purposes that we've covered today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hannah Patterson from the Linklater's Nakoda team. And I'm gonna give you a run through today of is to create in the context of some of the interest rate reform documents. So is to create is a platform on which you can negotiate, deliver and execute documents. It's intended to make your life easier and create efficiencies in the negotiation and delivery of your documents. The first page when you log on to is to create is this page. So we call this the dashboard. It's intended to give a bird's eye overview of the management information on your account and it comes in two parts. This top section is the analytics panel and the bottom half is the activity table. The analytics panel provides a visual representation of some of the key analytics that you can get on the platform. So for example, you have this first graph, which shows what your users or team are currently engaged with, and you can hover over to see a breakdown of particular users. The second graph shows negotiation stages by turn, and it shows how many negotiations are sat with you or your counterparties and what stage they're at. The third graph shows the time elapsed and it shows a breakdown of the number of days since the last action. There is then this filter bar, which allows you to filter um, to find negotiations of a particular type. The bottom part of this screen shows the activity table and that sets out, um, you're able to filter so you can find negotiations at a certain stage or of a certain type or with a certain user and basically forms a to-do list. However, the key bit that you probably want to know about is how you start negotiations. When you navigate to the library, you're able to see all of the documents that are available to negotiate or create and negotiate through is to create So here you'll see first the ISDA initial margin documents. These were the documents that the platform was originally set up for. And that was because there was a regulatory push to put in place initial margin documentation. Since then, and especially with the pushback of initial margin implementation, the focus has shifted and we've added on new documents. So we now have a couple of generic amendment agreements and a number of interest rate reform documents. We're constantly adding to the interest rate reform documents as they get published by ISDA. So taking the first one, 
the interest rate reform document. So this is um, one of the documents that is related to the IBOR fullbacks protocol. Uh, it's labeled as 1B in the ISDA documents library. And you'll see on the left-hand side, we have a set of elections. And on the right-hand side, we have a visual representation of the pre-printed ISDA document. Now, ISDA Create allows you to go through and make various elections that are envisaged by the ISDA published document. One thing that's a little different about this interest rate reform document is ISDA, when it published document, also published a number of standard amendments or kind of rider language that can be included in this amendment agreement in section two further amendments. So we'll be able to show you how that's been represented in the platform. So when you're going through and drafting the document, you are able to make the elections that are um, envisaged in the document that ISDA has drafted. And so at each stage, you're able to click and go to that particular provision. If you're unsure what the provision means and ISDA has included footnotes, you're able to find where the footnote is by selecting this button and then selecting the footnote to understand um, what ISDA wanted you to think about when you were drafting this. You're able to make the various selections that you need. And as you click through, certain or extra options may appear. So for example, on the further amendment section, um, if you select applicable, various extra elections will appear. And this reflects, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that certain template language was also published by ISDA. So if, for example, we want to exclude existing documents from the scope of the IBOR fallbacks protocol, we can make this applicable. And then we're able to select to insert language from the ISDA published template wording. And as you may be aware, there was various options. If I select option one, you will see that language appears on the right-hand side to reflect what was in that template amendment uh, language. And then various extra options appear. So I might want to list the triggers and fallbacks in the paragraph. And if I do so, a box will appear where I can type in whatever I want to include. However, it may be that I want to include that in the annex. So I take this and instead select the to include the triggers and fallbacks in the relevant annex. And if I select this button, I can then go to that annex and I can fill in the document and the language that I want to include. And you'll see that as I do this, it appears on the preview screen. I may change my mind and want to select a different option. And if I do, I would then have similar options that would appear. And so the intention is that you would go through and fill in all of the various options that are necessary to, um, to fully agree whatever changes you want to in relation to this document. As with any ISDA document, there's always an ability to make changes. So although the elections on the left-hand side correspond to elections that are in the pre-printed form, the platform also has an other provision section. So if you wanted to make changes, you could make whatever bespoke changes you wanted to. Um, once you have chosen or selected and filled in the document as you want to, you're then able to send the negotiation. So for this example, I had started just from the document and I'm able to search for my account party. So perhaps I search for is there. Um, this is linked up to the LEI database and any entity which has an LEI will appear here. I can, however, add a bespoke entity and an email address that I want to send it to.
Once I've done that, I'm then able to confirm the parties and send that to my counterparty. The example I've just run through was starting an invitation from scratch. However, sometimes I might want to create presets. Presets are effectively templates and you're able to create as many presets as you would like. You create a preset by navigating to the presets tab in the library section. You can select new preset and then you select the document you might want to create a pre preset of. For example, perhaps I want to use the Euro SDR amendment agreement. I can create as many presets as I like. So I'm going to create a specific one for when I'm negotiating against EU counterparties. By creating the preset, I'm able to then start from this particular set of elections each time I want to send out this type of agreement. So it saves time when drafting. It also allows me when I receive an invitation to compare that invitation against what is my house position. So there you can see I've now saved a preset and I can start an invitation from that preset if I want to. And so in terms of the negotiation lifecycle, we thought about sending an invitation and perhaps creating presets, which you might want to do prior to sending an invitation. The second of the three stages of the negotiation lifestyle are negotiation. So this is when a counterparty has accepted your invitation to negotiate and then sent back some comments on that document. The negotiation can go backwards and forwards between you and your counterparty as many times as it's necessary to enable you to agree the document. And you can see, for example, in my dashboard, I can find a negotiation that I've received. So you can see here that three weeks ago, I received a negotiation to, or an invitation to negotiate the Euro SDR amendment agreement. When I open that, I can unlock that, which means that I'm the active user. When I do, do that, I can then compare it to the preset I just made. And any changes I can see by looking at this navigation panel. So if I select this button, I can click on not agreed and it easily takes me to any elections that I have a different position to my counterparty. My counterparty wants to make this applicable. I had put not applicable. If I make this applicable, you'll see that this goes green and shows that we have agreed. Very quick way of comparing my position to my counterparty's position. Once I've gone through that, I'm then able to um, send that back to my counterparty. And I'm doing that by accepting the election and then sending that back to my counterparty. The one thing I didn't mention was that when you set up presets, you're also able to set up approvals. So approvals are the ability to require that any change to a particular position would require the approval of another member of my organization. So this is quite useful if, for example, you know that changing perhaps the compensation provision should be agreed by the risk team or the legal team or the sales team. And you're able to include as many approvers as required. And if I try to change something that was subject to an approval, then it would create a notification to the relevant approver. And before that negotiation can go back to my counterparty, the approver would need to approve it. Some other points that are useful to note are in relation to completed negotiations. So I said that there were three stages in the negotiation life cycle. Once you've sent your invitation, you negotiate it. At the end of the negotiation, and assuming you've got any approvals that are necessary, you're then able to move to the final stage. So that's where you've agreed the document. And I can look for some of the documents that are in execution stage by using this, this tab, which allows me to find the ones that are at this stage. So you can see that this document is in execution stage. That means me and my counterparty have agreed all of the elections and 
we've received any approvals necessary and crucially we've agreed what date we're going to sign it on. At that time we're then able to download the signature pack which contains an execution version in PDF and signature pages for me and my counterparty. I can then once I've downloaded my signature pages, I execute offline in the usual way. And my counterparty can also log on and execute offline and then upload the signature pages and confirm that we've executed. Following confirmation that execution has occurred, you're then able to access some extra data. So this is metadata around the elections of the data. So if I select the completed tab, I can see some of the negotiations that have already been completed. And you can see here an ability to download the audit trail and also a metadata file. So the audit trail shows you the all of the different um, actions that have happened on this negotiation. So very useful if you're trying to go back and find out perhaps who has approved something or what, um, who made changes to a particular provision. The other thing that you're able to download is the metadata. The metadata shows the data that you can get from the document. So it shows all of the elections that have been made and what the response to those elections were. And this is something that you can then use APIs to plug into internal systems. It doesn't really look like very much to us, but um, a computer would find that much easier to read. So I think we've covered all of the stages of the negotiation lifecycle, um, focusing particularly on the interest rate reform document that we looked at earlier. There are lots of resources on is to create So if you are using the platform and you have any questions, you're able to access the resources and usually able to answer your own questions because it's intended to be easy to use and um, we have a number of videos and questions that you can use to assist. But of course, if you ever have questions, there are also support services available. So there's a phone number and an email address that is available during UK business hours. The platform has got quite a lot of functionality now, so demonstrations get longer and longer. But if you would like a tailored demonstration to the documents that you are hoping to use on is to create, or you want to just investigate and see the platform further, then please get in contact with Linklater's Nakoda or ISDA directly.